I have, I'm going to give you a real heads up here. I have the heaviest deep in the woods message you would not believe. And uh, we're teaching on the end times, and uh, you can start turning to Matthew 24. I, uh, I, this is just a subject that's very, very few people understand, and, and they misunderstand the Bible on a lot of things. A lot of people don't know the end times very well, and the end times are a little difficult. Uh, in the Bible, they're the hardest subject, and, uh, and, and so there are some things in Matthew 24 and some other passages that are very confusing to people. Some people just kind of don't understand it and just kind of, you know, read on, and that's fine. Uh, some people get bad doctrine because they don't understand the whole picture of it, and they don't put all the scriptures together. In prophecy, it's as vital as anything else. You understand all the scripture. You can't just take one chapter. You've got to, these things all work together. Uh, Matthew 24 works with uh, Mark 13, works with, uh, works with Matthew 25. Very few people associate Matthew 25 with 24. It's part of the same subject. It's continuing on uh, with Revelation, with Daniel, with Isaiah. These things all flow together. And, and just like the first coming of Christ, if you're looking forward, we said before, if you're looking forward and trying to figure out who is this Messiah, why is he riding on a donkey when he's the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and why is he hanging on a tree? And why, what is this a friend that betrays him with a kiss for 30 pieces of silver? And he also rides in a white horse. It'd be very confusing because prophecy is, is for those who study the most and for those who are um, really diligent and for those who are watching the most carefully. Um, and most people don't, don't, don't get it. The people who knew the Old Testament well, the Pharisees, missed the entire thing in the Messiah. The first part, they didn't want to deal with the suffering of the Messiah. They just wanted to deal with the triumphant return. And so they missed the suffering Messiah. And, uh, and they completely missed that because they, the prophecy was there, and they would have known it, um, but they were, they were looking uh, with a very shallow point of view. All they could think about is he's going to come back and return, restore Israel, and we're going to kill these Romans. That's all they could see. And, uh, and so they missed him hanging on the tree and, and dying for our sins and being raised again from the dead and all those things. And... And so prophecy is very difficult, and today I'm going to talk about the rapture and the second coming, and uh, this is something that I really, it's going to be very heavy. I'll give you a heads up. I'm going to be reading a lot, and I'm going to be explaining a lot of stuff, and if you don't have a a little bit of idea of prophecy, it might be a little confusing to you, Um, but hopefully I'll make it simple enough um, for us all to understand, And uh, but I think I have to do this all in one message, otherwise I don't think I can get it across, and it's probably enough for three messages and uh, so we'll just uh, see what happens. And uh, but I won't keep you too long. You'll get there. Um, you'll get home by six, I'm sure. And uh, so, um, but no, you won't be that long. And uh, we'll get out somewhere near the normal time. But we got through everything pretty quick today. Matthew 24. I'm going to start at uh, verse uh, 27. For as lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So. We're talking about the Jesus coming. It says like light, lightning flashing across the sky. That's how it happens. Um, For where the sewer of the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Uh, let, me, let me explain a little bit to you. <clears throat> okay, so Jesus is talking about the coming of the Son of Man, and he talks about birds being gathered together to eat carcasses. Okay, that'll be important later on in all of this. Uh, Every detail I'm going to tell you is important because we're going to look at two comings and they're different and all these details will show us they're different. Immediately after the tribulation of those days uh, shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the uh, heaven shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn when they shall see uh, the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Okay, uh, I'll get back to it. And he shall send his angels with the great sound of the trumpet, and they shall gather together the elect from the four winds of the earth, uh, from the end of heaven uh, to the other. Okay, that is a coming of Christ, uh, the second coming. Uh, verse 36, but in that day and hour, but of that day and hour knoweth no man, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. For in the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the stars that were uh, before the flood came, they were eating and drinking and marrying and going to marriage uh, until the day that Noah entered the ark. And knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the son, coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall two be in the field, one shall be taken, the other left. Two shall be at the grinding at the mill, one shall be taken, the other left. Left. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. Let's go ahead and pray. 
Father, as we study your word, Lord, it's amazing, it's beautiful, and we thank you for it. We thank you for all the things that you do for us. Thank you for the Bible. I pray now that I'd rightly divide the word of truth. Guide me and help me to just say what is right and true. Give us all attention, Lord. Help those who don't know you as Savior to come to know you. Uh, and I pray that those who don't know you, or those that know you, would grow in grace, would walk with you, would keep their eyes open and watch and be ready for you to come at any time. We pray the scripture would be clear and you would speak to our hearts in a mighty way as we look into uh, some heavy doctrine, Lord, but you said the, the Spirit searches the deep things of God. And I pray that he would help us to get into these things and understand them. I need your help and I pray for that help today in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, we see uh, raptures here, um, but they look different. On the first one, we see um, a picture of of, of birds gathering for to eat carcasses, okay? And then we see a picture of um, all the earth and all the tribes looking and seeing Jesus and being terrorized, okay? Um, and, uh, and, and so the first one we see with lots of signs, verse, thir- verse, uh, um, uh, verse uh, 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened. And the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the earth shall be shaken. So, first of all, this first one, there's massive signs. There's a, there's a massive bunch of birds coming, we'll read about it later in Revelation, uh, coming to eat um, uh, uh, dead bodies. We see stars falling from heaven. We see the sun darken. It says, all of a sudden, massive signs in the stars are seen by people. And then we see um, the signs all over. Uh, verse 30, then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man. And so it's, it's full of signs. Um, we, they see Jesus in this, in this coming here. They'll see the sign of the Son of Man coming, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in clouds in heaven with power and great glory. They look up and they see Jesus coming. And they see that very clearly. And, and they see Jesus coming out of heaven. So there is signs, there is eagles, uh, there is, there is, there is uh, e- eagles and carry-on birds coming. There's, uh, 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 that's, there's carcasses, it says, all over the place. There is stars begin to fall from heaven, and, and the, the sun doesn't give her light and all kinds of... So it's over at least 24-hour period. You can see the sun and the stars both. And you see uh, people see Jesus coming, all the tribes, everybody in the world sees Jesus coming, and they're very scared, and all, uh, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in clouds in great uh, power and glory. And so that first coming, you, you see signs, you see Jesus, uh, everybody sees Jesus, you see um, a world in complete destruction. We see that all the way from verses 19 through 22. And woe to them where they're with child uh, to, to give them, uh, and then they give suck in those days. But pray that your flight be not in winter, neither in the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation, since there was not since the beginning of the world up to this time, nor ever shall be, except those days shall be shortened, no flesh shall be saved. So it says the world is in such bad shape, and it is the worst time. And we said, what, what did we say last week? In one event, in it, uh, one third of all the ocean water is just turns to blood. In another event, one third of the fresh water is turned to blood. Uh, creatures come out of hell, begin stinging people, uh, and for five months they're tormented. They can't kill themselves, even though they want to. We see uh, see a massive uh, comet hit the earth. Uh, we see um, the the sun uh, uh, heat up. Uh, so hot that people are burned to death underneath the sun. We see hailstones that weigh about 80 pounds hitting the world and destroying things. Uh, we see every green tree burnt up. Uh, we see the, the world is just, it, it's the worst time in the history of the world. The world's had some bad times. See World War II. I mean, the devastation in North Africa to all the way across the Silk Road, all the way into, it, it happened in the Middle East, it happened all the way across Europe, it happened at Pearl Harbor, it was, it was everywhere, it was, but it was nothing, like this is the worst time in the history of the world, worse than the Dark Ages, worse, uh, worse than the, the, the Mongols coming and, and, uh, and, and, and all the, the uh, Attila and, and, and worse than all the wars, and it's just, the world's a smoking disaster after the Tribulation. And then, with all these signs and all these things, people see Jesus coming. Now look at this second part of the passage here. It says, verse 37, it says, But as in the days of Noah, so were also the coming of the coming of the Son of Man be. For as the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying 
and giving him marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so that all so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Two shall be in a field, one shall be taken, the other left. Two men, uh, two women shall be grinding at the mill, one shall be taken, the other left. That looks different. First of all, people are making merry, <laughs> not seeing massive signs and not seeing stars fall from heaven. We're not seeing the world is not a burnt cinder. People, it's like the day before Noah. Before Noah, just to understand, before it rained, there was not a sign. They were just living and having fun, mocking Noah. Then all of a sudden, God said, all right, Noah, get in the ark. All, all the animals have got in. Noah gets in the ark. People are watching. might have said, huh, why are those animals all coming in the ark? And then Noah gets in the ark. Door shuts. God shuts the door. And then all of a sudden, they get a drop on their head. And it never rained before. Somebody says, who spit on me? And, uh, and all of a sudden, more drops, more drops. And all of a sudden, a massive. And the, and the Bible says also the earth opened up and the waters and the deep came up. And it was a, all of a sudden, the flood began. And, and boom, there it was. No signs. And just like those days where God took his people out, okay, and all of a sudden, uh, so shall that coming be, where everyone's peaceful and thinks it's all party and doesn't care, and all of a sudden, one's in the field, one's disappeared. One's taken away, the other's left. The other one, two are granted the mill, one's taken the other left. Nobody, nobody sees it coming, it's just boom, they're gone, disappeared. That is a different event. The world's not destroyed. People are having fun, getting married. They're not looking up the skies. They don't see Jesus. They don't see anything. All of a sudden, they turn and go, where'd you, where'd you go? And they're gone. And you can see these things just in Matthew 24. Uh, these things are very different. This is like the days of Noah or the days of Lot. It's peaceful and celebratory. Um, nobody knew. Just disappearance and sighting. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and just disappearance, there's no sightings or signs. Verse 40, Then shall two be in the field, one shall be taken, the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, one shall be taken, the other left. This looks different, okay? And these are, this is not a destroyed world. They're, what are they doing? In the days of Noah, they're eating, drinking, marrying, giving a marriage, until the, son of, uh, until the day Noah entered the ark. They look different. They look massively different. What is the difference? Well, the key to this whole thing, in the end, is what we see. You don't know when he's coming. Verse 44, therefore be also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Verse 42, watch therefore, for you know not what hour the Lord doth come. Verse 36, even that day, an hour knoweth no man, not the angels of heaven. My Father only says, look, pay attention, because nobody knows this event, this peaceful one. Notice that. Around the peaceful one, we have three verses in uh, between verse 36 and 44. In eight verses, okay, uh, three of those eight verses say, watch, you don't know when it's coming. Watch, you don't know when it's coming. The ones before says, you see signs of the Son of Man coming. And you see all these things, and you see the destruction, and you see all these things coming. So they, they're, they're very, they look very different. And, and one is imminent, one is instant, one is people partying, making fun. One, one, is, one is boom, all of a sudden people just disappear. One is everybody sees and what has happened to the stars and, and why are these dead bodies are everywhere and all these things. And, and here comes, here comes uh, uh, the sun is falling and the meteors are falling and the stars are falling. They are massively different things, these two events in the end times. And by the way, this is the last seven years of the world. Uh, and that they have that. Now, I'm going to take you to a different passage and, and explain it to you and show you this. And again, I'm using a lot of Bible here, and I'll try to explain it all to you. I'm going to go to 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians. And a very misunderstood passage also by a lot of people. 2 Thessalonians, in chapter 2. And you got to read the Bible carefully, just like you would in Jesus' first coming. God says things very carefully. And uh, chapter 2, verse 1, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not so soon shaken in mind, nor be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, neither by letter from us, that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there be a falling away first, and the Son of Man, uh, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition who opposed and exalted himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. 
Remember not when I was with you, I told you all these things. And now, uh, and now ye know that withholdeth that ye might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Very heavy passage, very hard passage. I'm going to explain it to you a little bit. Because it's going to explain these two comings and make a difference to them. The context of this passage, if you go to chapter 1, these, uh, these uh, Thessalonian, Thessalonian Christians, they were under great persecution. The persecution was so great for them that they actually thought that it was a tribulation. They actually thought that this was Jesus had come or they missed it or he's about to come. And they said, this looks like the end of the world because they were under such great persecution and uh, such bad things were happening. And, uh, and they, were, they were suffering so bad and they really uh, had a hard time with that. And, uh, and so if you look at uh, chapter 1 and verse 4 and 5, it says, you're, uh, he says, so yourselves glory uh, in you and the churches of God for your patience and the faith of all the persecutions and tribulations that ye endure, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be uh, counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which also ye suffer. They're suffering a lot, and so he's explaining about that. And then he says, guess what, guys? I know those people are persecuting you. I know you're suffering, but this is not the end of the world. And understand, those people who are persecuting you, Jesus is going to judge them one day. And watch how he talks about that. When he comes, he's going to judge all the ungodly people, and it's going to be a terrible time. It's going to be a scary time. It's going to be a fierce time. It's not going to be pretty. In verse 7, it says, And to you who are troubled, uh, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that also, uh, oh, but that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Okay, now notice there, he said, look, when Jesus comes, he's mad, and he's going to punish them with everlasting punishment, in flaming fire, taking vengeance. He's saying he, when he comes, it's going to be fierce. It's going to be vengeance. It's going to be fiery. It's going to be it's going to be judgment on these people. Okay, and he says, look, that's what he's going to be doing, and, and that that's a, a fierce thing that they are going to face. Jesus is going to come. He's going to appear. He's going to appear. Verse seven, unto you which are troubled, uh, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven, and with mighty with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance. So in this coming, he's talking about Jesus appears, he comes to the world, and he takes vengeance. Now, let's move forward, and you follow carefully. Chapter 2, verse 1. Now, I beseech you, brethren, I'm teaching you about this, this thing I just told you about, by the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, when Jesus comes, and, and by our gathering together unto him. He separates those two things. And that's everything. Okay, we're going to show you other verses where he does this. He separates these two things. He says, the coming of Jesus when he's revealed and about our gathering together unto him. Because they're two different events. One, Jesus revealed. One, Jesus is not revealed. One is flaming fire taking vengeance. One is reward and joy. One is comforting. One is fear. One is revelation. One is a disappearance. And they're much different. The day of Christ is scary judgment, chapter 1, verse 7 through 9. And, and uh, <clears throat> it, does not, it, it, it does not come until a couple events come. So Jesus coming to earth, okay, Zechariah 14, many other passages, you've got to understand the whole passage, the whole thing. Read Daniel, read all these, read the minor prophets, read a whole bunch of things. It's all over. Read Isaiah, read Revelation. It parallels with Matthew 24, parallels with 2 Thessalonians 2. They all flow perfectly together. When you put them all together, we find that, that, that Jesus, when he comes back to earth, <clears throat> he is actually comes down and puts his feet on the Mount of Olives, and it's a second coming. He actually comes to earth. But the gathering together unto him is spoken of as a signless, instant, boom, people just disappear. Okay, they're two different events. They're two different events. There's two events preceding Jesus coming back to earth. He says, guys, this is not the tribulation. That's not going to happen until a couple things happen first. 
A couple things have to happen before you guys, before the, the tribulation. So don't worry, you're not in the tribulation. This, this persecution you're going through is just a localized thing. In the end times, an Antichrist is going to come. He's going to be over the whole world. He's going to be revealed, and he hasn't been revealed yet. You're not in the tribulation. That you, 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 don't worry about that. Relax. It's, it's not the tribulation. He says, I'm talking about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together unto him. Two things, and. Verse 2, that you be not so soon shaken in mind or troubled. The coming of Jesus is not supposed to trouble you. Amen. Uh, neither by letter nor by word, nor by, uh, as by letter from us, that the day of Christ is at hand. Notice, what's the day of Christ? It says right there in verse 1, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's when Jesus comes to earth. He says, the day of Christ, where he comes to earth, he takes vengeance, he, he comes and becomes king of kings and lord of lords on earth. That will not come. <clears throat> it's not here. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there become a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So Jesus will not come back, his second coming, the day of Christ, where he's glorified and comes to earth and destroys all of his enemies. That day will not come until you will see the Antichrist all over the world, and he's ruling and reigning, and, 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 and that's not happening. And so that day is not going to come. Who opposed and exalted himself, he makes himself as God. Uh, and then he says, verse 5, Remember not, when I was with you, I told you these things. Relax. I already taught you. This is, you're not going to be in this. It's not, it's not the way it goes, the way you're thinking here. You're just getting that. And then verse 6 and 7 are very interesting. And now ye know that withholdeth that with... <laughs> That which that he might be revealed in his time. There's something withholding the Antichrist from being revealed. Okay? Verse 7 For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Okay? The devil's spirit is already working in the world, and the Bible says that in 1 John 2 and other places. Uh, does already work. Only now he that letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Okay, a couple things. Withholdeth. So we see something's withholding the Antichrist. And then it says, he that letteth will let. That word let, and I could tell you a whole bunch of verses in the Bible, the old King James Version, the word let means hindered. Okay, that's what the word means. Okay, and you'll say, I should have, I should have give you a bunch of passages, but I don't have time. Um, there's a whole bunch, but the word let means hindered. So somebody, him that letteth, is hindering the Antichrist, and he will be taken out of the way so that the Antichrist can deceive the whole world. Watch. Watch. And uh, <clears throat> uh, verse 10, for in with this all deceivableness of unrighteousness and them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, they might be saved. He comes and, and a strong delusion and a strong uh, confusion and a, and a deception that the whole world follows the Antichrist when he comes. It happens because the Holy Spirit is the who is withholding it, is taken out of the way. How in the world can you take the Holy Spirit out of the way to quit hindering the Antichrist from, being, from, from deceiving the whole world? You take the temple of the, of the, of the Holy Spirit out. It's called you and I <laughs> as believers. We're the people with the Holy Spirit inside of us, and the Holy Spirit works through us, and the Holy Spirit flows in churches and, and around believers when the Holy Spirit is not there to say, no, this person's deceiving you. This is a deception. This is wrong doctrine. You don't worship this man. When the Holy Spirit hindrance of deception is taken out of the way, the Antichrist can go and deceive the whole world, which he does. Okay? And, and he's able to do that. And so a couple things, events happen. I'm going to, I'm going to, now I'm going to, if I haven't gotten the weeds yet, I'm going to get in the, really in the weeds here. You follow me so far? More or less? Okay, good. Hey, very smart. And, uh, and, uh, and, and, and so a couple things happen. First of all, a falling away. Okay? Um, verse 3, it says, Let no man deceive you, for that day, Jesus coming back to earth, shall not come, except to come a falling away first. Okay? The first thing that's got to happen that he says before Jesus comes back to it, there's a falling away. Falling away. What is that falling away? The word falling away um, could mean two different things, okay? We know at the end times that there is going to be a falling away of the church. And when G we're getting near Jesus coming back, the church is going to change. And this word in the Greek is apostasia, um, it, which means apostasy. And it very much could mean it, there is not going to be 
uh, the, the Antichrist is not going to come until an apostasy comes to church, and he's telling them it's not come yet. Very possible. It fits the scripture. I'm going to take you to another passage that says this, 1 Timothy. We know there's going to be apostasy at the end times. And by the way, you say, man, what's happened to the church? Churches are so whacked out. So many crazy things happening. So much greed and so much man worship and so much about money and so many bad doctrines and craziness. And, and, and that's just a sign of the time. Don't be too stirred up. Just stay in a good church. And stay right. Don't let, don't let it get you down. Don't, unless you can't find a good church, but I, I reckon you can. And uh, and, uh, and and 1 Timothy 4, and uh, <clears throat> verse 1, it says, Now the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, uh, having their conscience seared to the hot iron, forbidden to marry, and, and, uh, and uh, commanded to abstain from meats, which God hath uh, created to be received with thanksgiving uh, of them that believe, uh, of them which believe and know the truth. He says, look, there's going to come a time when the church starts falling away, and there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, uh, uh, a departing from the faith. So don't be too stirred up. That could be when he says there's a falling away first. The man of, uh, that day, Jesus will not come to earth, it, you, don't worry, you're not there. First, it's got to be a falling away. Is it a falling away of the church? It could be. Let's go back to that passage. Another thing it could be in 1 Thessalonians 2 is it could be the rapture. Departing, the falling away, the word is used, and I'm going to uh, get into this word, the falling away, apostasia, except there come a falling away first. Okay? That's got to happen. Um, that's got to happen first. This falling away. Um, I'm going to explain this this word to you a little bit, and and under, uh, help you understand the word apostasia, because the word means a couple different things. It's used as a noun twice in the Bible. This is one, the ones in the Book of Acts, but it's used the verb a whole bunch of times. And long and short of it, when it's used a verb, it's the word departing. Okay, a departing. Um, and let me read you some things here. The word in the Greek compound of is a Greek compound of apo, and which is the word from, and istemi, which is stand. So it means from standing. Um, thus, it could mean uh, away from or departure. Um, <clears throat> uh, the verb. Uh, let's see. Lindell Scott's book, A Greek English Lexicon, defines apostasy as first as a defection or revolt, then secondly as departure or disappearance. Gordon Lewis explained how the verb from which the noun apostasy is delivered is derived um, supports a basic meaning of departure than the following. The verb may mean to remove spatially. There is little reason then to uh, deny uh, that the noun can be mean, can, be, can mean such as a spatial mover, a removal or departure, since the noun is also used only one of the time in the New Testament. Uh, the verb is used 15 times in the New Testament. Of these 15 times, only three have anything to do with departure from the faith. The word is used for departing from iniquity, um, the, from, uh, from ungodly man, it means you're leaving there, um, from the temple, you're just leaving physically a place, or from the body, uh, or, and from other people. And, and there's a lot of references here. It is a f with full assurance a proper, proper exe uh, exegetical study and the complete confidence of the original languages concludes Daniel David that the word meaning apostasia is defined as departure. What, is pr what precisely does Paul mean when he says falling away in chapter 2, verse 3, must come before the tribulation? The word in the definite article, the, denotes that this is a definite event an event distinct from appearance of the Son of Man. The Greek word for falling away, taken by itself, does not mean religious apostasy or, def or defection. Neither does the word uh, mean to fall, as the Greek have another word for that, pipto. The word translate of the word, the best translation of the word is de to depart. The apostle where Paul refers to a definite event, which he calls a departure. Um, the first seven English translations of apostasia in this passage in 2 Thessalonians all rendered the noun as either departure or departing. The Wycliffe Bible, the Tyndale Bible, the Cloverdale Bible, the Kramer Bible, the Beecher's Bible, the Beza Bible, and the Geneva Bible all say departure uh, instead of that. What am I saying there? <clears throat> I can go to the use of article and really bore you, but I'm not going to. This could also mean, except there become a falling away, that word means a departure or a disappearance. It could also mean that day will not come unless the rapture happens first. It could be either one of those things. 
Either way, he's saying, look, this, this event isn't here yet. Um, for, the church has not fallen away and had a mass change uh, in, in their doctrine and fallen away from good doctrine. Um, we're seeing that today. It wasn't happening then. But there's been a lot of times of apostasy. The Dark Ages, the 1500s, the, there's been a lot of times of that. But this word, it could mean, the word means a, a disappearance, a taken away. It means a rapture. It could mean either one of these things. And either one of those would work. So that day is not going to come until those two things happen, the departure and the Antichrist is revealed. And, uh, and, and so we see that our gathering together unto him is different from the day of Christ. Okay, we see that here in, in, in chapter 2 and verse 1, by our, uh, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. Our memory verse, I'm going to take you to Titus and uh, read you out of Titus. In chapter 2, our memory verse, you'll see it here also. Why? Because this ugly situation where there's death and destruction and judgment and falling things falling from heaven does never looks like this comforting sudden disappearance. The one at the signs and the ones with uh, uh, people wailing does not look like the ones that people just disappear. Watch in Titus 2, in our memory verse, verse 13, looking for that blessed hope. That sounds great. And the glorious appearing. One is appearing and one is our hope. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're looking for these things. We're looking for them. One coming, and back in 2 Timothy 2, one coming is vengeance. Chapter 1, verse 7 and 8. One coming is a blessed hope, Titus 2, 13. And they're referred to differently. Even in Matthew 24, you can see the difference between the two. In the same chapter, one is, you see the signs, you see the death, you see Jesus coming. The other one is, boom, where'd they go? One's called blessed hope. One's called a day of vengeance. One is scary, chapter 2, verse 2. One is comforting. First Thessalonians 4, 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven to the shout of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall uh, be caught up with the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. One is Jesus being seen. We read that earlier in Matthew 24. Revelation 1 says, Every eye shall see him, and all the kings of the earth shall wail because of him. One is unseen, Matthew 24, 40 and 41. In, let me take you to Revelation 19, and uh, let me take you there and show you that. Are you following this so far? Because people get very confused because they're saying, uh, you know, this doesn't make sense. Um, where, why, why does it look like the rapture can't happen until this point? And why does it look like after the tribulation the rapture happens? A rapture happens after the tribulation. That's why it says immediately after the tribulation. Okay, but the thing is, after the tribulation, you know the exact number of days, seven years, 360 day years, you just do the math. It's very simple. You go forward uh, three and a half years from the abomination of desolation, you know the day Jesus is coming back. It's all, but Jesus, but the, the other one, the other one, he says over and over, nobody knows when, nobody knows when, nobody knows when, nobody knows when, nobody knows when. Nobody has any clue. It's such a day as you think not. At the end of the tribulation, if I'm in the tribulation, I can go, oh, look, there's the abomination of desolation in the temple. The, 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 the Antichrist is in the temple in Jerusalem. Okay, we've got 1,260 days until Jesus comes back. That's all you have to do. The, the Bible counts it by the day. Okay, you know it, all that stuff. But this other one, you don't know what's coming. They're different. One's the rapture. One's the second coming. One, Jesus meets us in the clouds. One, Jesus comes to earth. Okay, Revelation 19, we see these things differently, and uh, we see other, how we're different. Uh, Revelation 19 <clears throat> and verse 14, it says, And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon a white horse, clothed with linen, white and uh, clean. We find out that's the saints that comes back as you read the Bible, and we are coming down with him. In 1 Thessalonians 4 and in Acts chapter 1, uh, we see us meeting him in the air. In one, we're coming down. In one, we're going up. 
In one, we're coming back to earth with him to rule and reign. In one, we're going to meet him in the clouds. And so should we ever be with the Lord. One is the blessed hope. One is the one we look forward to. One is a glorious appearing where everybody sees Jesus and understands, oh no, he is God. Amen. That's what's been happening. We did fall the Antichrist and they wail because of it. Now, a good way to understand this, and let me back out of the woods for a second here, and, uh, and, 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 and to help you understand this, a good way to understand this is to understand uh, the phrases that God uses here in the Bible, and you'll see it so clearly when you see this. Let's look in Revelation chapter 19, and let's look at verse 7. It says, let us be glad and rejoice, there's that happiness again, and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife has made herself ready. Marriage supper of the Lamb. Okay, we're going to talk about the uh, marriage supper in, in, in Jewish uh, history. Now we're going to see another meal, and it's going to fit perfectly. Watch. And in uh, and, and verse 17, it says, And I saw an angel standing in the sun and clothed with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls, there's those birds, we read, remember that? The birds before the really bad coming, the really dark thing. All the fowls of heaven in the midst of heaven, come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and the flesh of them that sit upon them and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. Okay? One is the supper of the great God. That's Armageddon, where so many people are killed and the birds, God gathered, angelically calls the birds from the world and says, we got to clean this up. There's a lot of bodies. The other one is called the marriage supper of the Lamb. They're both at the two different comings, and they both fit in uh, prophetically. A Jewish wedding uh, system and, and supper, you know, it's fascinating. I've been, I, I am preparing for our young people this next year. I'm going to prepare uh, for those who want it is, I think, the best way biblically to date and go through the process of finding a spouse and get, getting married and all that stuff, using some biblical principles and stuff like that. I'm going to prepare a booklet for that for, for our young people, and it's not going to be, ugh, I like her, let's go. Uh, and, uh, and we're going to make it a little more thorough than that, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and but we're going to prepare that. But this marriage supper is an interesting thing. <clears throat> and uh, and uh, first thing starts with the betrothal. And you can see this in Matthew 1, verse 18 and 19. You can see it in Malachi 2, 14. I'm not going to read you all these passages. I'm going to give you references. You can look them up on your own. Uh, Mary was betrothed to Joseph. Okay? And uh, a betrothal is when the, the, the families come together and make an agreement. And it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a formal agreement. And there's a dowry given. Boy, I wish that was still the day. I have five daughters. And uh, I don't know where that thing went. And, uh, goodness, and, uh, and uh, they establish a dowry, dowry, hear that brother Nick, dowry, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, they, they uh, establish a marriage covenant, a dowry is given, paid the price, and they are espoused. You can find this biblically in 2 Corinthians in chapter 11 and verse 3, Paul said, I've espoused you to one, even to Christ, okay? We, the Bible says, are the bride of Christ, it says that Ephesians 5, 25 through 27, 2 Corinthians 11, 2 and 3, and other passages, everybody kind of knows that. You and I are the bride of Christ. We, as all believers, are the bride of Christ. You'll see us coming together with Christ in Revelation uh, uh, 21 and, and so forth. And we are the bride of Christ. And the marriage supper, it says, we're going to go to a marriage supper. The first thing is the establishment of the, of the covenant of betrothal. And we now have done that. When we get saved, we now become the bride of Christ. There's a dowry paid. That was the blood of Jesus paid Amen. for us to become the bride of Christ. And God says that Christ loves us as Christ of the church and gave himself for it and all the passages on that. The second part of the passage <clears throat> is the taking of the bride from her house to his father's house. So one night, and you'll, 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 you can see this in Matthew 25 and other passages, um, the parable of the ten virgins and, and so forth. What happens is the, the, the husband-to-be, he goes to the house, um, uh, and usually at midnight, and they carry lanterns, and it's a big celebration on the street, and he goes and takes her from her house and takes uh, her to his house or to his father's house. Usually uh, depends on, on the situation, how wealthy they are and where the guy is in life, but it's either going to be his house or his father's house. What did Jesus say? 
He said, let not your heart be troubled. Do you believe in God? Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And so Jesus says, I'm going to come and get you and take you to my Father's house. And we're going to begin uh, the next step. It's never at her house. That's inappropriate in the Jewish culture. And Jesus does not come to our house to live and be with us at the marriage supper. Because we have this world that he is not going to come. He already came once. And when he comes back to the world, it's to fix it. He does not come to our house at the, because that doesn't fit the, the, the wedding feast. At the wedding feast, is always at the groom's house. Not here on earth. Not in this world. It's different. And we'll get back to that a little bit later. And where is it at? Is it in heaven? The marriage supper is going to start and the celebration, because the marriage supper is a huge celebration. Is the marriage celebration going to be in the Father's house, where Jesus said it's going to be, or on a destroyed, smoldering earth? Honey, look at the ruins. Isn't this beautiful? Let's, let's eat. That's not what it's going to be. Okay. The blessed people, the people who get invited are blessed. Revelation chapter 19 and verse 9, he said unto me, right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said unto me, these are the true servants of God. Because the wedding feast is known for gladness and myrrh. You want some passages? Jeremiah 7, 34, 16, 9, 25, 10. You are not supposed to mourn. You are not supposed to mourn at the wedding, at the wedding feast. You're not supposed to mourn there. Because once he gathers her and they consummate the marriage, the next day the wedding feast begins, and it lasts for seven days. And when Jesus comes and takes us to heaven, the we we'll have a wedding feast and a marriage supper of the Lamb up in heaven for seven years. You never mourn at these things. Go to Matthew uh, chapter 9. Let me go to think of Matthew 9. <clears throat> Matthew 9, Jesus is, these disciples are asked, why don't, why don't your disciples fast? And Jesus says, I'm gathering, I'm, 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 I'm preparing to uh, pay the dowry for my bride. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, the bridegroom is with them, and you don't mourn with a bridegroom. And I am with the bride right now. And uh, in chapter 9, in verse 15, it says, Can the children of the bride chamber mourn as long as a bridegroom is with them? But the days will come and the bridegroom shall be ta taken from them, and then shall they uh, fast. And you can read in Matthew 25 and look at the passage, and you can see that uh, they're talking about <laughs> Matthew 24 happens, and he's talking about the Son of Man coming, you don't know when he's going to come. And then, let me take you there. I'll just wear in Matthew. I'll show you this. And again, I don't have time to do every passage. But <clears throat> no man knows the day of the hour, Matthew 24, the rapture's coming, and Matthew 25, then, first word, <laughs> how, how many people do I see getting an error in Matthew 24, and they never understand Matthew 20, the, Matthew 25 is continuing, then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins which took not their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Five of them are wise, five are foolish, and he goes forth into the parable and going to the to the going to the groom's house. Okay? And 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 we see that the parallels are there amazingly. And that's what the in the marriage supper is supposed to be, is seven days of celebration. So Jesus comes instantly, boom, could be today, could be during this church service. All of a sudden, everybody who's born again, boom, we're gone. And maybe a few people are left here because you haven't received Jesus. By the way, don't risk that. And, and all of a sudden, they're gone, and we begin, the, 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 the groom just took us to his house, seven years of celebration, we're going to be up there during the marriage supper of the Lamb while the angels are pouring out the wrath on the earth. And for seven years, we'll be up at the marriage supper of the Lamb. It says, blessed are those who go to the marriage supper of the Lamb, not those who go to this, the, the, uh, the, the, the feast of the great God, because that's where the birds are eating it. The kings. And if you have a choice to go to a beautiful marriage supper and celebration or go to where the birds are eating that, and you can see, by the way, same things in Matthew 25, 24, you see it in Matthew 24, you choose to go to the marriage supper of the Lamb. It all fits in perfectly 
uh, in those things. So then we go back and we look at Matthew 24 and we say, well, wait a minute. It says after the tribulation, verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and all those things. And then he shall send his angels, verse 31, and they shall gather together the elect from the four corners of the earth. Look, there's a rapture. He gathers all believers, all the elect. He does. He gathers a whole bunch of believers. But blessed is going to say are those who have part in the first resurrection. Because we're going to be ones of the marriage supper. These people get raptured at the end of the tribulation. Yes, they do. But they're tribulation saints. And people who get saved, and they're Jewish people who get saved during that. This is foretold in Isaiah 27, verse 12 and 13, and he talks about he is going to have his people scattered, and when Jesus comes back, when Messiah comes back, in, in Isaiah 27, verse 12 and 13, he says he gathers his Jewish believers from all the world and brings them back to Jerusalem when he comes back to earth. That's really what confused the Pharisees. They said, wait, wait, wait. This isn't, this isn't, everything's not working according to that. But that is when Jesus comes to earth. The Jewish people are called elect in Isaiah 65, 9, in many of their places. And he says he gathers his elect. See, so the Jewish people are going to be saved during the tribulation. And let me take it to Romans. And again, this is a whole other sermon, but it's not going to last very long because I'm going to teach fast. I've already been going fast. How many think I'm going too fast? Okay. And uh, sorry. Get this, buy the CD on YouTube for free. And, uh, but uh, I'm going very fast. I know I am. And, uh, and, 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 and I'm just, you mean me to listen to this again and, and, and look at these scriptures. But in end in, in times, understand, there is what's called the time of the Gentiles. We're going to read that in just a sec. There's what's called the time of the Gentiles. We're in the time of the Gentiles. Okay? God turned from the Jewish people, uh, from the nation. I shouldn't say that. Let me rephrase that. God did not turn from the Jewish people. He turned from the nation of Israel, and he turned to the Gentiles. That's all over the Bible, especially the book of Romans. Book of Romans 9, we'll read it in a second. And we are not now in the time where God is working through Israel like he did throughout all history. He's working through the Gentiles. And it's called in the Bible the time of the Gentiles. Now, God has the church instead of the nation of Israel. And the church is his bride, and the church is his people, and he's working through us, and he's working through the church. Now, a Jewish person can come to Christ, and they do, and we've had Jewish evangelists speak in our church service and become wonderful believers, but they're not doing it as an Israeli citizen, as they did in the Old Testament. They're doing it as an individual, just like a German or a, or a Russian or anybody else comes to Christ. We're in the time of the Gentiles, but the time of that Gentiles ends suddenly, and Daniel's 70th week starts again, which is God working on Israel and their time of suffering, and Israel comes to Christ as a nation. We'll read that here in uh, Romans chapter 11. And the time of the Gentiles ends, and God's working with Israel again. In verse 25, for I would not... Brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceit, that blindness in part hath happened to Israel, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved, as is written, they shall come out of Sion and deliver, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Jesus came, but he has not yet taken the ungodliness out of Jacob. They missed the Messiah. But all Israel is going to be saved. The nation as a whole is going to get that temple back up and they're going to come and during the end times, the church is going to disappear. And all of a sudden, there's going to be two prophets in Jerusalem preaching the gospel in Jerusalem and Israel is going to get saved as a nation and come to Christ and say, goodness, we missed it. What do we do? They're going to start reading the New Testament. They're going to start reading Matthew. And they're going to come to Matthew 24 and it's going to give them instructions of what to do for the Jews in Judea. Matthew 24 is a chapter about a location and a people, the Jewish people. Matthew 24 is a tribulation chapter. When the is Jewish people are saved, during the, during the tribulation, 144,000 Jewish evangelists, 12,000 of each tribe, they're all male, they're all virgin, and they're all from 12,000 of each tribe, they get saved, and they are scattered throughout every corner of the world, and God puts a stamp on their forehead and tells all the angels, no plague touches them, they need to go preach the gospel to everybody. And they go around the world and they preach the gospel to everybody. And Israel as a nation gets saved. The Antichrist comes against them and says, what do you mean you're not going to worship me? I'm God. 
And he goes in the temple and puts himself as God in the temple. And the Jews are told that time, run to the hills. I got to protect you. He's going to try to kill you. And they, uh, they, got, they run to the mountains, and God has a place to protect them from the Antichrist. The Antichrist armies are chasing him. The earth opens up, swallows up the armies, gets rid of the armies, and they're protected until the end of the tribulation. And then at the end of the tribulation, Jesus comes, and he gets all the believers. There's a huge bunch of people who get saved in the tribulation. The problem is they get killed. A lot of them. But not all of them, but the 144,000 are some chosen that will be in every corner of the world. And just a couple of verses. Let me just take you to Revelation. Let's go to Revelation um, 7. Let me go there. All right, almost done. The clock's ticking. Revelation 7 <clears throat> and uh, verse 3. Saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till, the, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And uh, verse 9, it says, And the tribe of Zebulun were sealed 12,000. The tribe of Joseph were sealed 12,000. The tribe of uh, Benjamin were sealed 12,000. We see uh, that they are all over. And after this, I beheld in a great multitude that no man can number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palms in their hands. And there's a great, great harvest, the Bible talks about, where the souls get harvested and many, many people come to Christ uh, during this tribulation time. And so, well, the church got raptured before, but everybody gets saved, the nation of Israel. There's going to be many believers. It could be just Israel because they're called elect. It could be all believers who get saved and are still on earth, but God gathers his people together at the end of the tribulations. All right, let me give you entrance into the kingdom here. And he raptures them and brings them all to him. But there, when he's doing that, is dead carcasses, is signs. Everybody sees it. Stars are fallen. Jesus is coming back. The whole world's in destruction. It is a different coming in every point of view. And then Jesus physically comes to earth. He touches the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives splits in, in, in different directions, and waters flow out of it. The world begins to get healed, and Jesus uh, begins the new world, and he heals the world. And uh, we see in chapter 14 and verse 4, these are they which were not defiled with women, they are the virgins, they are they which follow the Lamb with us wherever he goeth, and these were redeemed from among men, being first fruits unto God and unto the Lamb. The 144,000, how can you call it first fruits? Why? They're the first people saved during the tribulation. We've already been called first fruits unto God. But they're the first ones are in the tribulation, the first fruits. Why? Because it's a great harvest. And the first fruits are the first part of the harvest, the first ones that are ripe. That's the 144,000. They begin spreading the word all over the entire world. And we see this. There are so many martyrs in chapter 6. And, uh, and uh, you can write these references down, 9, 10, 10 through 13, uh, and, uh, or uh, 9 through 10, and then chapter 13 and 15. The Antichrist begins to kill believers, and there's a lot of martyrs. <clears throat> Now, I'm going to say one more thing, and I'll be finished. I'm going to go back to 2 uh, Thessalonians 2, this passage. All right, big breath. Okay, and uh, now let me just tell you the last thing. We wanted to show you that there was, you know, and once you, just, once you just get what I told you, that there's a rapture, and there's a second coming, a whole bunch of prophecy will make sense to you. A whole bunch of passages that were very confusing will make sense to you. Okay, you'll understand why it's hope for some and fear for others. Okay, you'll understand a whole bunch of things. You'll, you'll get Matthew 24 makes a whole bunch more sense. Second Thessalonians 2 makes sense, all those things. I want to say really importantly is this. If you're in this room right now and you're hearing the gospel, my fear is, and I think, I'm, I think it's pretty clear here in this passage, that you say, okay, if everybody disappeared, I would just get saved then. I don't think you will. I, don't, I believe the Bible teaches that if you know the gospel and you've heard it and you had a chance, that if you did not get saved during this time when the Holy Spirit's here, that during the tribulation, a spirit of deception will come and you will not be able to get it. And you will not be saved ever. And some people think, well, I'll just wait. Don't, don't wait. Let me read you just a passage about this that, that, that's kind of fascinating and and in, in, in 2 Thessalonians 2, we've been reading a lot out of it about, this, about the, these problems, about deception. 
And, and it says, uh, talking about the Antichrist, even him who is coming, verse 9, is after the workings of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivable, deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusions, that they should believe a lie, that they might be damned, who heard, who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in righteousness. They, the people who heard the truth are given a spirit of deception. The people who are saved in the tribulation are people who never heard it. And so I want to say to you, if you're not saved today, if you never received Jesus Christ, receive him today. Because it might be too late otherwise. He can come at any moment. One shall be in the field, and one shall be taken to the left. If you've not received Jesus Christ as your Savior, he died for your sins. If you're trusting your good works or religion to save you, you're going to miss out. Jesus will not take you. You're not saved by being good. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourself. It's a gift of God. Jesus paid it all on the cross. You can't save yourself. Only Jesus can save you. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. If you never trust in Christ your Savior, do it today, because Jesus might come today, and all of a sudden, one will be taken, another left. All of a sudden, in a church, because somebody's going to be in church at the rapture, a whole bunch of people are taken, and some are left. And you don't want them to be left. And, and, and that's why it says in Matthew 25, get your oil in you. That's the Holy Spirit. That's salvation. Matthew 25, five were prepared for him coming back. Five weren't. And five were left behind. Matthew 25. You don't know when he's coming. So let's just be ready. Make sure you're saved. Make sure you're serving. And the Bible says, be also ready for in such an hour as you think not the Son of Man cometh. It's going to come and nobody's expecting it. I just need to be ready 24-7. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the word. Thank you for it shows us, Lord. I pray today as we went into a lot of doctrine. But Lord, I thought it was also connected, Father, and I felt like you just wanted me to just really get deep and run far with the doctrine. I pray today that you would help us to understand what you teach. And I pray today that if someone doesn't know you as Savior, they would trust you as their Lord and Savior. We pray that they would be born again. We pray that they would not be left behind. Pray for those who are, served, who are saved and know you, that they would live for you and love you and uh, give their life to you, knowing that you may come back at any minute and purify themselves and be busy trying to win souls and do your work. Lord, help the word to make a difference in our lives that you appointed it to, and thank you for the Bible and all it teaches us and all these passages that flow together, so many we didn't get to. But Lord, thank you for the Bible. We love it. We thank you for it. May this truth make a difference in our lives. pray this in Jesus' name. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. If you don't know if he died today, you go to heaven. The gospel, getting to heaven is simple as this. You're a sinner. Your sin will keep you out of heaven. So Jesus died for that sin. He died for all of it. He was buried and rose again three days later. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And if you'll believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. If you say, I need Jesus to save me, I can't save myself, and call upon him to save you, he'll save you. If you never trusted Christ, today's the day. Maybe this message has come because Jesus is coming today. Who knows? I don't know when. Would you like to receive him today? I'm going to say a prayer. The Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He'll save you today if you ask him and trust Jesus alone to save you. These prophecies, you've been going over them, are coming true left and right. Can you trust Christ today? If you never trusted Christ, you don't have to pray out loud. You can pray silently in your heart. And I'm going to say a prayer. You can make it your prayer to God. And why don't you just pray this to the Lord? Dear Father, I know I'm a sinner, and I don't deserve heaven. But I know you sent your Son, the Lord Jesus, to die for my sins. I trust Jesus now as my way to heaven. Come into my heart and forgive me for my sin. I receive Jesus as my way to heaven and as my Lord and Savior, in Jesus' name. Heads about, our eyes are closed, no one looking. How about you? This piano's going to start playing quietly, but how about you? Did you receive Jesus today? If you did, I'm not going to embarrass you at all. I want to celebrate for you. The Bible, I, I'll know if you received him, because the Bible says, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. You won't be ashamed of receiving Jesus. 
you'll want people to know it who would say, I received, I prayed and received Christ today. Would you lift your hand right now? I just prayed that for the first time I received Christ. I just did that. God bless you. Anybody else? I just prayed for the first time and received the Lord Jesus. I asked him to save me. God bless you. I'd have never done that before. Put your hand down. God bless you. Maybe today you'd say, Pastor, you know, I'm not the bride I should be for Christ. I'm not the kind of, I'm not, I'm not ready for him to come back. I'm not living diligently. I'm not we're laboring for him. I'm not winning souls. I'm not, I'm not living a holy life. I'm not faithful to God like I should be. And if he came back today, I'd be ashamed. First John 2 warns of, warns of that. <clears throat> First John 2 says, Abide in him that we come as you may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. We don't want to know when he's coming. So the Bible says, be also ready. For in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Who'd say, maybe I'm not ready right now, Pastor? Would you pray for me? If that's you, would you slip your hand up right now? Pastor, I've not been living, I've not been uh, careful, I've not been diligent. I'm not sure if Jesus came. I'd be, I'd be proud to face him right now. I need to be more diligent in my Christian life. God spoke to me. Would you slip your hand up right now? Pray for me, Pastor. I need to be more diligent in my Christian life. I need to, I need to be ready. He said, be also ready, and I don't think I'm ready. <clears throat> Someone else I want to witness to. There's more work I want to do for God. There's some things I want, to, I want to change in my life. Pray for me. Anybody else? Would you slip your hand up? Pray for me, Pastor. I never raised man before, but pray for me. I'm not ready. There's someone who's not saved. There's someone I'm praying for that I, I just haven't given the gospel yet. <coughs> God bless you. You can put your hands down. I'm going to pray for you. Maybe where you are, you can talk to God. Confess what's making you not ready. Say, Lord, if you'll give me another day, I'll go talk to this person. <coughs> I need to apologize to this person. And Father, your word is so amazing. We study it and never get to the bottom of it. There's so, so deep and so much truth in there. Thank you for it. Lord, as we looked hard today at uh, understanding the rapture and the second coming, the blessed hope and the glorious appearing, two different events, Lord, as we study this. I pray today we'd understand better what's going to come in the future as we've been studying the end times. Lord, I pray you'd speak in a great way to our hearts. And help us to be diligent, to be found in you. Help us to be ready. I pray for every hand that was raised. 